any good stories to pass the time? Video games and storytelling have gone hand in hand for decades, and in that time, developers have come up with some pretty creative ways to communicate their story to the player over the course of the game. From those good old text boxes to extensive cinematic cutscenes, to the more subtle approach of visual storytelling, games have explored a massive variety of ways to tell a story. But what about everything in between? What about the times when the game has to loosen the story chain and let some gameplay happen? What do we do about all that empty space? God of War, released in 2018, was a major departure from the previous titles of the God of War franchise. Many of you will probably know about the significant character development that Kratos underwent in the five years since God of War Ascension, but the reboot changed so much more than just our eternally furious protagonist. God of War practically resurrected the entire franchise by giving it a brand new identity that even the previous games couldn't hope to match. The old God of War games were big, bombastic, and brutal selling themselves on an ever-increasing spectacle of huge bosses and plentiful gore. They were essentially a product of their time, when games could still sell themselves on over-the-top violence and still be deemed cool. The reboot, by contrast, was significantly more mellowed, more subdued. The series had its fun, and now it was time to mature the franchise that was becoming rather stifling. Kratos now has a cool beard and no longer speaks in all caps. He has himself a new wife who's dead and a son named, uh... Boy! Kratos and Boy must take their mother's ashes to the highest peak in all the realms, and if you've played this game, you'll know that this plan goes off without a hitch and no violence takes place at all. <laughs> First, you need to cut off my head. Wait, what? Now, the previous game started with us thrown almost immediately into some sort of humongous boss battle. God of War 1 had the Hydra, 2 had the Colossus of Rhodes, 3 had a Poseidon fight on a whole ass titan, and Ascension had whatever the hell this was. But this God of War strived for a more paced story than ever before, seeing fit to take its time and dole out story as and when it needed to. The game is also open world now, taking place across five of the nine realms of Norse mythology, yet another departure from previous titles. It is this open world that is the subject of today's video. A couple of months ago I started a small series discussing a few aspects of open world game design. One of the problems that I presented was the idea that many open world games have tons of empty space, and not a lot to do with it. My own suggestion in that video came down to the idea that not all empty space necessarily needs to have anything in it, and that there were ways to mitigate the issue. There was one method I didn't mention, however, as I thought it deserved its own video. This is the value of empty space. She was a gifted sorceress, who gathered every tome of arcane wisdom she could find in the realms, all in the hopes of augmenting her powers of prophecy that she might find her lost husband, Arvandil. But it was not her husband she would glimpse in her visions, for it was Groa, seeing longer and farther than any before or since, who witnessed Ragnarok, the end and the beginning. When Odin caught word of her ultimate prophecy, he maneuvered to obtain her knowledge and hoard it for himself. Groa knew Odin as a long-time patron of her services, and so she welcomed him into her library as a friend. What she did not know is that Odin himself was behind her husband's disappearance, having used his enchantments to conceal his death at Thor's hands from her sight. Smiling, jealous Odin took her by the throat, and with his very hands he stole her library and her life for his own. Let's talk about what I mean. Almost every open world game comes with the same quirk. Content is often spread nicely into little clusters across the map. You can see here on God of War's map that in Midgard, 
all the main areas wrap around this lake here. So we end up travelling through here quite a bit as the story takes us around the place, even if we aren't exploring. And there's the catch. We spend quite a lot of time travelling from one place to another, with little to no gameplay in between. Even when we're exploring or doing quests, there's still quite a lot of getting from place to place. Effective fast travel isn't unlocked for quite some time, and even when we get it, the game still has you moving around on foot or by boat. In this game, like a lot of open world games, we spend relatively long periods of time just travelling from A to B. But God of War does something special. All this time spent travelling, all that empty space, is used to great effect. Rather than running around Midgard in sullen silence, Kratos, Boy, and later Mimir will all talk to each other to fill in the silence. And the game takes as many opportunities as it can to squeeze in some more dialogue. Now, that might not seem like a very significant thing. Other open world games usually have something very similar. The likes of GTA and Fallout have radios, allowing you to play some music to pass the time. A lot of games even let you listen to audio logs while you're playing. Why does simply filling in dead air count as a good thing? Well. God of War doesn't just have characters talk for the sake of it. This reboot was introducing a whole new story from the Greek pantheon than we had gotten used to. And if we're being honest, not a lot of players are going to be that well versed in the broad strokes of Norse mythology. We get plenty of stories from Mimir that give us more insight into the story of the world around us, a world that both we and our protagonist are foreign to. He tells tales of the gods and goddesses and the rather colourful history of the realms. One moment that sticks out to me in particular is his short boat story about Thamur the Frost Giant. The beginning of his story starts by filling in the time it takes to sail to our destination, with the tale of Thamur and his son. I'm glad you asked, actually. I have just the story for you. <laughs> there was a giant once named Thamur. A very giant giant, who, despite his mountainous size, was without question the greatest stonemason this world had ever seen. Proud Thamur hoped to one day pass his vast knowledge onto his son, but young Hrimthur had the heart of a warrior. Perhaps the father had too much fear in him, or the son too little. Either way, a quarrel of theirs spiraled out of control, and the overworked stonemason bonked! struck his son. Arimthur ran off into the night. Feeling shame and regret, Thamur chased after his son, but in his emotional state soon found himself wandering Midgard, lost and alone. Sadly, he caught the eye of the one person he didn't want to meet alone that night, so far from home. Thor. And what happened next? You'll see. The end of the story is told to us as we sail around the corner and see Thamur's corpse, telling a story not only through dialogue, but also punctuating it through visuals, all without taking us out of the game and filling in what would have otherwise been nothing at all. Oh no, you fell in the village? Thamur fell, crushed a charming place famed for worshipping the Vanir god Njord. Thor always took credit for planning that one. The truth is, the sweaty clawbag just got lucky. The effect of this kind of storytelling on the player almost goes without saying. It would be remiss of God of War to tell these stories in any other way. Imagine if the game was broken up by cutscenes every time Mimir wanted to open his mouth. Or if he just stayed entirely silent and we just got journal entries that nobody would ever read. It would suck. What we got was a great middle ground, having the game tell us important or interesting information when our concentration is at its lowest. When the game doesn't have enemies or puzzles to throw at the player, it fills in that time with other things that are still very valuable to the gameplay experience. What this achieves, at least in Mimir's case, is a greater ability to world build, thus immersing the player further in the world around them. 
I think most of us would agree that being immersed and absorbed by a video game is generally a positive thing, and games can do it in many different ways. They don't necessarily have to fill in the blanks of the lore, like God of War does, they can also leave us in the dark and tantalise us with mystery. However, in an open world game like this, constructing the lore of that world bit by bit keeps us engaged in said world. If it has successfully managed to rope you in, you'll keep playing to discover more. If it hasn't, well, at least you won't be left hung out to dry by having exposition front-loaded onto you at once. God of War uses its spare time to provide meaningful context to both the world and the story, and thus continuously deepens the player's involvement within it. The frog. His pond had dried up. So the frog and his son left to find a new home. They found a well. The son saw the water and made to jump in, but the father stopped him. He saw the well was deep, and once inside they would not be able to escape if the water dried up again. Wisely, they moved on. That's it? Yes. It's really not a story. If the son jumped in, it would be a story. Then he would be trapped and starved while the father watched helplessly. See? That's a story. Mimir is not the only character that has expository dialogue. You don't meet him until roughly a third of the main story, and even when he starts travelling with you, our two other characters, Kratos and Boy, are talking it up as well, but for an entirely new reason. You see, Previous God of War games were all about family. They were stories that told of one man's noble quest to pay a visit to anybody even vaguely related to him and kill them in a variety of ways. The reboot, by contrast, is all about family. It is now a story about one man's noble quest to protect the only member of his family that isn't currently a red smear on the wall. In all seriousness, God of Wars 1 through Ascension weren't exactly Citizen Kane whenever it came to storytelling. Kratos was essentially a screaming ballistic missile, turning everything that looked at him funny into various flavours of orb. His only goal in those games was to kill, and the story didn't let you forget it. I'm not criticising those games by any means, it worked well to serve the violent, bloody-minded tone of the whole franchise. But if Ascension taught Santa Monica Studios anything, it was that players were beginning to get a little tired of a formula that was already getting somewhat stretched by God of War 3. Something had to give. And surprisingly, it was the entire identity of the franchise. If you had told a God of War fan in 2010 that one of the most well-regarded games in the franchise would involve Kratos being a significantly more mellowed father figure going on a soul-searching journey with his son, you'd have been laughed out of the room. Now, at time of writing, we're all eagerly awaiting the continuation of said story in God of War Ragnarok. The reboot upended previous games, and basically started from scratch, bringing with it its own challenges. It's not enough to simply say that Kratos underwent significant character development. The change was so steep that a lot of care had to be put into pulling off a believable transition like this. Not only that, but it now had to be done alongside an entirely new character, one that the writers presumably wanted us to appreciate as well. So, the problem the developers and the writers faced here is thus. Not only did they have to convince us that the Kratos we're playing as now, the one giving sagely advice to his son, is the same character that ripped off Helios' head to use as a flashlight. Not only did they have to convince us that his son is a sympathetic and interesting character while simultaneously placing him in the body of a whiny little twerp, not only did they have to take the characteristic equivalents of a ghost pepper and a bag of jelly beans and put them in close proximity to each other. They had to do all of this while developing these characters through their own respective arcs, 
and through their combined experiences throughout the game, making them different characters than they were at the outset of their journey. And do you know what? They did it. And I don't think it would have been pulled off without their keen ability to fill the empty space in the way that they did. Mimir talks a lot about the world and the stories within it, but Kratos and Atreus have their dialogues mostly focused on their father-son dynamic, and it's a dynamic that is continuously developed throughout the game. As we traverse the early game, the empty space is filled with Kratos and Atreus somewhat cold towards each other, as the former tries to rein in his excitable son as they begin their journey. Slow down, boy. Sorry. You are hunting deer, not chasing it. Yes, father. As the two continue this journey, they end up in the Lake of Nine. The game fills in the empty space here rather well, as Atreus asks his father to tell him some stories. So, know any good stories to pass the time? What kind of story? I don't know. Mother always had stories. Weren't you told me when you were a boy? There was a man I knew a long ago. His stories were brief and purposeful. Sounds... fun? The beautiful thing here is that these boat stories, however dryly they are told by Kratos, are soft allusions to his past. Kratos' main struggle throughout this game is to protect his son. Not only from those that would do him harm, but from the ramifications of his true nature as the son of a god, and the sins of his own past and how they would reflect on them. In essence, some of these stories are Kratos' way of warning his son against the ills that he himself was once guilty of. The story about Kratos and the hunter is of particular interest. He sought vengeance upon his enemy, a stag, but he could not kill the stag alone. The horse met a man, a hunter, and made a deal. He took the man's bit and bridle, and allowed him to ride in the saddle on his back. Together, they killed the stag, and the horse tasted victory. But the hunter would not release the horse, and made a slave of him. So getting revenge cost him his freedom. Hope it was worth it. It was not. This story is an obvious reference to Kratos and his servitude to the gods, in particular Ares, the former god of war. The boat stories not only fill in the empty space we would have had just sailing around, they also communicate the characters of both protagonists at this point in the game, with Atreus being eager to spend time with his distant father, and Kratos using the time to try and teach his son the lessons that he had to learn the hard way. Atreus is still young, however, and the deeper meaning of the lesson often escapes him in favour of questioning the specifics of the story, much to the chagrin of Kratos. These stories represent their relationship at the start of the game, with both characters never quite being on the same wavelength, but still making an honest try of it. Throughout the game, the empty space is used again to bolster particular character moments for Atreus and Kratos. After gaining the light of Alfheim, Atreus will be short with Kratos for a while, after Kratos spends too long in the dream that the light created. The only time you want to talk to me is when you need Do you want to tell me something? I said, the only time you care to talk to me is when you need me to translate for you. If mom was if here- If your mother was still alive, we would not be here at all. Once Atreus learns that he's a god, at first, the empty space will be used to let him be inquisitive, and to let Kratos continue to be elusive on the details. You sure I can't turn into a wolf? You are welcome to surprise me. Is this why I hear voices sometimes? Are you sure you've never heard any? Not as you do. That's no surprise. Every god is unique. So, maybe I won't get strong like father, but I'll have abilities all my own? You already do, laddie. Your faculty for language is extraordinary for one so young. Time alone will tell what else you'll become capable of. So you knew all along? I did, lad. But I've known more than my share of gods. Me too, apparently. 
Later on, Atreus becomes overconfident of his godhood, prompting worry from both Kratos and Mimir. I wish I'd known I was a god in Alphon. I wouldn't have felt so bad about killing so many elves. Well, I'm not sure that's the lesson. You've done nothing to regret. The elves forced their affairs upon us. No, I get it now. We had god things to do, and they were in the way, dragging us into their little problems. Again, are we just leaving that there? I mean, just knowing we're gods makes me feel so much stronger. Maybe you feel a little too good right now. With power comes a big choice, lad. You can either serve yourself, or put your godhood in the service of others, like Tyr did. People really loved him, huh? However, their relationship seems to even out somewhat, with the two of them sharing a rather wholesome moment in Tyr's temple. Look, I just want to know the truth from now, okay? I don't care if it hurts me or not. I was learned. Just because you hate being a god doesn't mean I have to. His newfound godhood gets the best of him, though, and after the three end up in Helheim for the second time, the tone of the dialogue takes yet another turn, and the empty space takes the opportunity to further bolster this change, with Kratos now reigning in Atreus for the final time. I'm not going to let it bother me. Like you said, Mimir, it was just an illusion. I wasn't there. No. But it is who you have become of late. Look, I know I got us into this, but I'll get us out. Whoever I am. I will get us out. You will follow orders. But maybe that's not who I am. It had better be. Now let me focus. Once back in Midgard, the two are more cooperative. See that, Mimir? Nobody can do all this alone. All these obstacles. They're just chances to prove we're the ones who can beat them. We may argue. Me and Father. You and Freya. Brock and Sindri. But when we all work together, we do make a good team. And that's Tyr's test. That's why we're gonna make it to Jotunheim. Do you hear that, brother? Lad found his equilibrium. What's that mean? It means you speak wisely, Atreus. And that is good to hear. This change is shown not only in our in-game dialogue, but also rather well through the final battle. Kratos and Atreus had their peaks and troughs. Kratos was shown many times not trusting Atreus with even his own weapons, but now they work together to take down Baldur, and this dynamic would not have been so significant had it not been for the game's very efficient and strong characterization. By the end of the game, these two characters, after many highs and lows throughout their story, their development comes full circle, and this change is represented perfectly by Kratos' final story, once again used to fill in the empty space. Kratos tells his son why he is called Atreus, with a very nice story from his past, with Atreus remarking that his father finally told a good story. So, why'd you want to name me Atreus? I know it can't be for a god. <laughs> no, he was a soldier, a Spartan. A great warrior? All Spartans are great warriors. We trained from birth. Our lives were discipline, duty, battle, and death. Life was grim, and we greeted it grimly. Mm. But Atreus of Sparta was unlike the rest of us. He wore a smile even in the worst of times. He was happy. He inspired us to hope that though we were machines of war, yet there was humanity in us, goodness. When the day came for him to lay down his life in battle, his sacrifice saved countless others and turned the tide in our favor. I carried him home on his shield and buried him with all the honors of Spartan custom. His memory was a comfort in dark times. Wow, you actually told a good story. But we missed it. And I think that really sums it up. God of War is a really good story that is really well told. Despite all the cutscenes and journal entries, the game really does take a lot of effort to sprinkle as much as it can into gameplay. Rather than separating these two halves like a lot of games, God of War understands the value of empty space and strives to maximize what it can do when you can't do much else. 
So, why is all this important? From a game design perspective, we always look at games for the effect that they have on us, rather than what the intended effect was. Games are inherently interactive experiences, made by people whose skills lie in multiple creative and technical mediums. Sometimes what a developer wants to give, and what the player ends up getting, aren't always the same thing, and a lot of the time, we can never really know what the developer wanted anyway. When the stars align, and developer intentions and player reactions happen to coincide, we are more likely to experience something truly remarkable. When I see how God of War provided me with a way to stay involved in long periods of relative detachment, surprise surprise, I stay involved in the experience that the game has provided me, where I might have otherwise lost interest in a world and a story that had consistently failed to even attempt to engage by not providing context. The game design genius here is not just using the space that you have to hand and working in some easy story, it was about using that space to mitigate the problems that it presented. The problem here being that these areas could have been long stretches of repetitive and monotonous gameplay. They mitigated the problem by filling it with interesting stories and conversation. You wouldn't read a book with blank pages, and likewise, you wouldn't listen to a story broken up by long periods of silence. From a personal perspective, it encapsulated something I really love about gaming. Video games as a medium are a very fascinating thing to me, in terms of what one can experience. You can read a book, you can listen to music, you can watch a movie. But in gaming, you can kind of do all three. What makes gaming truly unique is that it's able to provide an interactive experience like nothing else can, and it takes something truly special to ever transcend their respective mediums. God of War did something that only a game can do, and it did it incredibly well. If you look up footage of God of War on YouTube, you'll find a lot of videos about the stories it tells rather than anything like gameplay. The game takes the time it has to spare and turns it into a highlight. The developers of God of War, once famed for large-scale boss fights, made conversations on a boat some of the best parts of an already quality game. Gamers usually seem to recognise when they have a good thing, and they recognised God of War's more nuanced approach to storytelling as just that. I have never seen a more positive reaction to the reboot of a respected series, apart from maybe Doom. Despite the departure from the roots of the franchise, Santa Monica Studios saw the value of the empty space, and thankfully, when the game came out, players saw the value in it as well. And now, hopefully, so do you. So, what other stories have you got? 